Good morning, my name is Sarah Thompson. My partner and I, Sarah Heilig, are interviewing Mr. Edward Taraskowitz, who was a member of the Air Force and was in fighting during Vietnam. He was born on December 17th in Lowell, Massachusetts. Can you state your name and branch of service, please? Hi, I'm Ed Taraskowitz. I'm Taraskowitz from the Air Force. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. I was going to be drafted. A friend of mine told me my name was coming up, so I decided to enlist in the Air Force. Where did you receive basic training and did it prepare you? In Amarillo, Texas, a uh, place that's no longer being used. Uh, did it prepare me? Uh, for what? Yes, probably. <laughs> um, what was your reaction going overseas? Scared at first, uh, a little apprehensive, but I was still young and figured I could uh, not be hurt, so I was fine and I went. What is an SM Sergeant E-8? Senior Master Sergeant. Uh, I stayed in the Air Force for 20 years, retired after 20 years. Uh, E-8 is the second highest enlisted rank you can achieve. Uh, the top 3% of the people in the Air Force get to that point. Is it possible you could ever be recalled into duty? Not now. I'm a little too old. Mm -hmm. What is the first Special Operations Squadron? Uh, that was a squadron, I think there's still some around. Now they are more in the, uh, how could I put it, uh, covert uh, operation. But Special Operations Squadron then was a, was a squadron of A1Es, which was a World War II vintage fighter uh, attack plane that they were using during the Vietnam War. There were some in Vietnam and some in Thailand. They were used for escort duty uh, to attack places along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, they would drop different kinds of ordnance. They were overly powered and could handle more ordnance than most normal airplanes. Uh, but they were an old 1940 vintage aircraft that uh, we enjoyed working on at the time. Explain the NACO fan on Thailand, the terrain and your time there. Uh, what was it? Nako Phnom, Thailand. It was Nakon Phnom, Thailand. It was a base kind of cut out of the jungle. Uh, if you drew a straight line, it was above the DMZ, the demilitarized zone uh, in Vietnam. You know, we were just over the border from Laos. The Mekong River ran along uh, downtown Nakon Phnom, which was probably five miles down the dirt road to get there in a very fast driving bus. It was scary. It was probably one of the more scary things we had was the ride to town. Uh, again, it was a base, a lot of aircraft there. There was A1Es, there were uh, A26 aircraft, another old World War II vintage airplane. There were helicopters, uh, OB-10s, which was one of the newer planes at the time coming in. Uh, some observation aircraft, O1s. There was quite a quite a array of aircraft there, but it was a Base that was just suddenly put up. Uh, there was no real concrete other than a runway. The, the ramp was PCP, uh, which was a, a metal perforated flooring that uh, was just stuck down. That's what we had our aircraft parked on. That's what we worked on every day. Wouldn't that reflect the heat from the sun? Oh, yes, it did. <laughs> uh, if you think you're working on steel every day, that was the floor, and it was rather warm there. How did the people react to? The base and the presence of Americans? Uh, it was Thailand, so it was uh, probably a more friendly atmosphere. Uh, the Thais, uh, Thailand was free land, that was what the Thai word stands for. Uh, they enjoyed the Americans, we enjoyed them, but we, you know, we were good for their economy. Uh, a lot of money going into the area. Did uh, you frequently travel to the city? Uh, bought once a month. Didn't have a lot of money at the time, so once a month would take a ride into town, uh, see what was going on had lunch over the Mekong River. Uh, interesting. <laughs> now you say the Mekong River, did you ever go swimming in the river? No, you didn't bother going swimming in anything out there. <laughs> uh, the water was not clean like we have here. Uh, uh, even along the side of the road they call them Benji ditches. So that's kind of what the bathrooms were in a lot of cases. <laughs> what were you responsible for as an aircraft mechanic? Uh, my aircraft, and sometimes two. Uh, we were pretty much young troops. We were just a little older than you. I think I was 20 when I was over there. 
Uh, and right away, as soon as I walked in, uh, I was given an airplane. Though it's all mine. Uh, took over and just had to make maintain it every day and watch it with the uh, for the missions. Uh, made sure it was always ready to go. Fueled it, oiled it, uh, changed tires, changed whatever parts need to be changed. Inspected. Were you angry that you had no combat service? Not really. No. One of the reasons I joined the Air Force, uh, I didn't think it was really for my benefit to learn how to shoot a gun. What is a Connex? You described where the weapons were stored. A uh, metal container with a lock on it. Uh, we were trained when, we, when I went through uh, familiarization training in uh, Florida. Uh, we were trained on how to fire the M16, uh, you know, rapid fire, regular fire. Got marksmanship metal on that. Uh, wasn't difficult to fire. A little scary when you fired in the uh, automatic uh, mode. Uh, but we weren't. We normally didn't carry guns as aircraft mechanics. So we were. The base was pretty much protected by the Thai Army uh, and the Air Force Security Police. That was our means of security. There were weapons there if, for some reason, we were to be attacked and overrun. There were weapons, and they were locked in these metal lockers, big, big metal lockers. Uh, but somebody had to go unlock them so we could get at them. Uh, we always wondered, you know, if we were ever going to have to do that. Luckily, we never did. A few times we thought we might have to. Describe your typical working day. Uh, it was a 12-hour shift, six days a week. Uh, there wasn't much else to do, so that's what we did as we worked. Uh, Went out every day, uh, had our roll call, and went out and worked on our aircraft. And ours wasn't go, doing anything. We'd go help our friends' aircraft. Uh, we'd all make sure we all, you know, everybody's aircraft was ready to go. And usually the, the missions flew almost every day, every other day. So it was, you know, busy every day. We had something to do. Uh, come back, have to prepare the aircraft, wash it, clean it, uh, fuel it. Uh, used a lot of oil. Used to walk around with a lot of oil, dripped all over us. How's the food? Edible. <laughs> uh, the eggs, I remember, were powdered eggs. Uh, one day they brought in real eggs and they were still frozen. I don't know if you've ever seen a frozen egg on top of a frying or a griddle, and the yolk was still round like a ping pong ball. And uh, when the cook cut it to break it, it just split in half. <laughs> but I decided I'd pass on that egg. <laughs> Um, how were the quarters where you lived? They were called hooches. Uh, we didn't have air conditioning. Only the pilots had air conditioning. And it stayed usually rather warm. Had fans. We had uh, mosquito nets over the beds. Uh, became accustomed to it, naturally. You, you adapt. Uh, used to sweat all night trying to sleep. Or if you had it during the day, it was even worse. At least at night, it cooled down a bit. Uh, but they were dusty. Uh, they were screened on the side with slat, wooden slats. Uh, Screens. How are the bugs, like mosquitoes and things like that? Uh, the mosquitoes weren't bad, but they had a different variety of bugs there. A uh, thing called a rice bug, which was uh, looked like a rather large beetle, probably two to three inches long. And at certain times of the year, I guess when they were mating, they would fly, and uh, they would fly all over the place. And they didn't fly well, <laughs> <laughs> so they would crash into whatever your head. Uh, you'd be walking along and get smacked by a rice bug. Uh, but it was also uh, a treat for a lot of the ties. They uh, used to bite off their heads and suck out the innards. Uh, I never tried it. Uh, I was told it was like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so what if you were hungry and say halfway through the day you wanted a snack after working for a long time in the hot sun? Mm -hmm. yeah, there was no snacks. I remember uh, just outside of uh, where we worked there was a it was a little bit of a gate, a barbed wire fence that nobody ever paid attention to because we already cut a hole through it. And uh, there was a little Thai girl that used to sell RC colas. And she was just, oh, maybe 10 yards on the other side of the fence. And uh, we'd just sneak through the hole and go over and get an RC cola. And I think they were probably a nickel or a dime for an RC cola. But as the day went along, because she was put out there early in the morning with some ice in a cooler and the RCs, well, the day went along, the ice melted. So I developed a taste for warm RC cola. That was the snack. <laughs> <laughs> Were you honored to receive medals from your actions in Vietnam? 
Uh, yes, uh, always wanted to, you know, have the fruit salad on my my uniform. That was probably one thing that makes you proud. You say, "Go ahead." Could you explain them, please? Oh, medals. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can remember all of them, uh, Air Force Commendation Medal. This was with two Oak Leaf Cluster 7s. I received it three times. Uh, Air, Air Force Achievement Medal. Uh, while I was there, the Presidential Unit Citation, which going from high to low, this is the precedence of order, too. Uh, can't even remember what some of these are. Good Conduct Medal. Uh, this was uh, the Vietnam. I'm sorry, that was the enlistment during time of uh, crisis. This was the Vietnam, one of the Vietnam medals. The southern one was the Vietnam medal. This was the campaign medal, the Vietnam service medal. Uh, marksmanship, overseas tour, Air Force Academy graduate, and so on. Did you enjoy the Bob Hope visit? Yes, that was uh, one of the highlights of the tour, uh, to see Bob Hope live. I wasn't 20 yards away from him. From the stage, I was able to get a spot right up front, uh, and one of the people he brought along was Anne Margaret, who at the time was hot. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? What the, the, the show? Bob Hope visit the show? Oh, it was fun. It was just uh, it was just a break from the routine uh, to see that, and to think that you know I actually get to see him because you saw it for years. He always visited all the bases, and you saw it on television or movies, but to see it live was. Yeah, it was fun. How long did that last? Oh, probably an hour and a half. Uh, and it was a big party. Everybody was there. Everything shut down. Because uh, the whole base was there. So if there was an accident or something happened while that visit was going on, it would have been a lot harder to react. Uh, there was still the security people were out. And, you know, they, we didn't just drop all security. Security people were out. So some people didn't get to see it. Okay. Uh, but I think the flying operation, the colonels, they knew that uh, this was a big thing, so there's no flying at that time. I mean, if we had to, we would have just disbanded and immediately ran to the, to the flight line. And it wasn't that larger base where you couldn't run around quickly. Okay. Please tell us about the incident with the plane in the Big The incident with the plane, that was my aircraft, uh, 472. It was in this book and we took pictures of it. <laughs> uh, I remember it was out one day and we heard uh, some of the aircraft took some uh, enemy fire. And uh, I knew mine was out at the time. There was also probably another half dozen aircraft. Uh, and when they were coming back, uh, you know, we heard they were all coming back, so there was nothing shot down. We looked up and they could see a hole in the left wing. And it just didn't look right. Uh, the pilot came in and he landed, and it was my aircraft. And I ran over, jumped up on the wing to unstrap the pilot, and jumped up there. Gee, sir, what happened? My God, what happened to the airplane? The pilot was the coolest guy I've ever met. Now, he had taken a, a surface-to-air missile through the left wing, which blew a 3 by 4 hole through it. His right flap was blown off. He had shrapnel all the way up the side. Uh, he wasn't aware of that, but it was cutting through some cables that uh, controlled his uh, flight controls. Uh, the plane was damage to, is actually beyond repair, we found out later on. Uh, but when I asked him, you know, what happened, and he just looked at me and he says, hey, Chief, I think I got a little uh, trim problem, which meant his uh, flight controls were out of trim. And that's how cool he was. Uh, anybody else, I think, would have been sweating bullets and saying, get me out of here. Uh, but he was that kind of a guy. So you were upset when you first realized that the plane Yeah, that was my plane, and naturally I was upset because I had spent, I don't know, it was about, Ten months on that airplane, eleven months. It was towards the end of my tour, and came back with uh, those big holes in it, and it was not repaired. Uh, they ended up salvaging it. So did they automatically switch you to another plane? Uh, everybody. They had other crew chiefs uh, taking over. I was kind of getting towards the end of my tour, so I was uh, taking care of other things. I was probably one of the more experienced. I was training some of the young kids coming in. Then, uh, while I was there, I went from airman second class to airman first class, and then they, that was three stripes. Then they changed the name to sergeant. So I kind of got two promotions within a month, airman first class to sergeant, but it was really the same promotion. So it's still a promotion in rank, but what does that mean for, say, pay? It was an increase in pay, increase in responsibility, and 
and uh, that's how things went in the military. You received another stripe, you got more duties and responsibilities. So with the 12-hour workday, about what time would you think you would get to bed and get up in the morning? Oh, uh, we were young. Uh, didn't need as much sleep. And it was hot, so you didn't sleep much anyway. Maybe slept five, six hours a night. Uh, go down to the uh, Airmen's Club and you know, have a few beers, play some blackjack. Uh, probably get to bed by 10, 11 o'clock, get up at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning. Usually it was about a 6 to 6. Please tell us about the crash at the end of the runway and the subsequent, subsequent rescue. That was uh, an unusual circumstance. We were working one day and uh, one of the aircraft was taking off and he was fully loaded with bombs and uh, munitions and weapons. And uh, something happened, the engine quit, and it just crashed at the end of the runway, taking off and just went flat down. Uh, the pilots were all strapped into the seats because uh, there was an ejection seat uh, that would pull them out, so they were strapped in buckles here and there. The pilot, uh, the plane caught on fire. Uh, the pilot was trying to get out and get hung up as he was trying to climb out of the aircraft and was kind of almost upside down, hung up on his straps. Uh, Coincidentally, just as that happened, uh, one of the rescue helicopters just happened to be taking off for whether it was training or to go someplace else. Saw what happened, flew over to the end of the runway. One of the rescue people lowered themselves down into the, the burning mess there with the aircraft and rescued the pilot out of that aircraft. Uh, I believe that uh, that crew received uh, so or probably bronze medals for what they did, but it was just. Uh, just one of those things that was happened right there, right in front of you. you know, almost saw the whole thing. Not clearly because it was at the end of the runway, but we saw what was going on. What was your first reaction? Just couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, the, that, that pilot, the only reason he was saved was that helicopter just happened to be taken off. If they had to wait for a crew to respond, he wouldn't have made it. Please tell us about the aborted takeoff crash with exploding 500 pound bombs in Oh, uh, That was just one of the scarier incidents. Uh, I was really towards the end of my tour then. I was down to probably 11 and a half months, a couple of weeks to go, sleeping uh, 2 or 3 in the morning. And uh, all of a sudden I came off my bed about 2 or 3 inches with a loud boom. Woke me up, I looked around, thought I was dreaming. Then another loud boom and I was another 2 or 3 inches off my bed. By that time I had my pants and my boots on and I was running out the door. Uh, 500 pound bombs make a loud boom. Uh, plus napalm was going off, uh, 20 millimeter uh, cannon shells, uh, rockets, everything was going off. A plane that was taking off, halfway down the runway, decided to abort, hit his brakes, and his brakes burned out. And he went off the side of the runway and crashed, and everything just started going off. Uh, all of the munitions and everything, I believe the pilot was killed in that. Uh, it was one heck of a mess, but it was scary at our end, and we were on the total other end of the base, and we were feeling the percussion of that at the other end of the base, which was probably a good half to three quarters mile away. And knowing I only had two weeks left, I was scared. I, want, I just wanted to get out of there then. Uh, the pilot, and like I said, he died in that. Uh, I don't think he could have survived with all of the munitions going off. Did the sound injure anybody's hearing? Not at my end. Uh, up closer, uh, I wouldn't be surprised somebody might have uh, had perforated eardrum here there because it was loud and it was it rumbled. With um, the side boom a couple of years ago, did you have any reaction to that? No, no. no. I got used to it after a while. <laughs> Who was Wormy Wiggins? Uh, I don't remember his first name. It was Wormy Wiggins. He was my Probably my best friend there. We worked on each other's aircraft. His was, I think it was 927, mine was 472. Uh, we were just good friends. Uh, he was from down south, down in the South Carolina area. Uh, don't even know where he got the nickname Wormy. Uh, might have been his face. He was a little pockmarked. <laughs> but uh, he and I were just good friends there the whole time. Uh, we never really communicated afterwards, though. We, after we left, uh, we just lost touch. Any specific um, things you remember about him best? Not really, just that we were we were the best of friends while we were there. We hung out together, we drank together, we played cards together, we worked on each other's aircraft together. Uh, just good friends. Uh, somebody I could depend on and trust, and I think he felt the same way about me. 
Who was Merrick K. Uselitz? Uh, he was another guy who was good friends. Uh, we were together in tech school, then we were stationed at Otis Air Force Base together for the first tour we had before we went to uh, NKP uh, Thailand. He went there about a month before I did and was in a different squadron. He was in the Sandys, which was I think the 22nd SOS, and I was in the Hobos. But uh, we ran into each other again there because we were both of Polish extraction. We, uh, he was from Buffalo, New York. Uh, the whole time we were at Otis Air Force Base together, we hung out. Uh, we used to, we were in the same room, we were buddies, uh, so we were good friends there. When we ran into each other in Thailand, uh, while I knew he was there, he knew I was there, we ran into each other and we hung out quite a bit. Uh, we went on R&R &R together, which is rest and recuperation uh, in Bangkok. Uh, and uh, we actually, we communicated and we stayed friends after. He ended up going to uh, Keesler, I think, in Louisiana. Uh, I stayed in the Air Force. He got out after his four years. Went back to Buffalo, uh, went to work for the post office, and uh, it was several years ago. I was still here at, uh, stationed at uh, Griffiths Air Force Base, and I had given him a call because I knew he was still in Buffalo, I found his number, and uh, he was in the Air National Guard out there, and uh, was flying on C-130s, and flew here to Griffiths one. They were up for a training mission one time, stopped in here at Griffiths, you know, let me know he was there, picked me up and flew me around the base, and we had a another little reunion, uh, brought me off and went back to Buffalo. What's the difference between Hobos and Sandys? Just different squadrons. Uh, the A1Es, A1As, uh, Hs, A1Js, they always seem to be known as Sandys, the A1s, uh, the type aircraft, but actually it was a squadron name. Uh, we were the first SOS and we were the Hobos, uh, the 22nd was the Sandys, but they for some reason called A1 Sandys. And you said Otis Air Force Base, where is that? Uh, Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Nice tour. I was on C-120, uh, EC-121s. Yeah. It's a four-engine propeller type aircraft, no longer in service. It was originally uh, for uh, Super Constellation. It was uh, used for the passenger airlines way back when. Do you communicate with any of the people that you toured with still? No, uh, I don't. <laughs> Just lost touch with everybody. I think uh, my time in the service, I was you know, involved with other things and raising a family. And no, I never really stayed in touch with everybody. Uh, there's one gentleman in Pennsylvania that uh, they've had one or two reunions from uh, NKP, uh, but it was in Las Vegas. Uh, I couldn't afford to go at the time, but uh, they've had a reunion or two. And he's sent me a Christmas card now and then said, hey, come on, you got to join in on one of these things. So maybe in the future I may get down to one of the reunions. Would you say you got along with everyone? Oh, yeah, I did. I think I did. I can't remember having any disagreements or any arguments with anybody. So how were people that were higher than you, higher rank? They were fine. Uh, the squadron itself didn't have many higher ranks. When I first got there, I think the highest rank was a staff sergeant, which was only four stripes. Uh, before I left, I think we had maybe a tech and a master sergeant. Not many higher ranks there. Uh, no, you know the officer was a uh, was uh, probably a captain or a major, and we never saw much of him. Uh, the pilots were officers, uh, but they were in different squadrons. Uh, the base commander was a colonel, but we never again we didn't run into many officers. Please tell us about the trip with the pilot on his plane and on the day off. Oh, he, uh, the pilots were great there, and uh, they used to, they would come out and take uh, the different aircraft mechanics up and give a flight, and one, uh, on his day off he came over and grabbed me, and he was going to take me up for a flight on an A-1, and uh, that was probably one of my most memorable things, uh, strapping in, because working on it all that time, and it was just fun to go up and fly, it was a two-seater, a big engine, uh, and we took off and we flew up and around the base and that's how I saw how the base was cut out of the jungle. It was just a big square cut out of the jungle. Uh, then he was going to show me what a strafing run was or a, an attack run. Uh, and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and what it was is he found a little crossroads uh, where two roads crossed. And he said, well, we'll make believe we're attacking that crossroad. And he brought the airplane up, brought it up and then put it into a steep dive like you're heading straight down at that crossroad. And I was watching and watching and saying, my, my God, we're getting closer and closer to the ground. 
And uh, it was funny because there was, uh, I think, a Thai, an older Thai gentleman riding a water buffalo, and he looked up and saw this airplane coming down. At him. <laughs> I think he dove into one of those Benji ditches to get out of the way. Uh, but then the pilot pulled it out, and that's when I learned what G-forces were. Uh, before that, I never knew the G-forces were so strong, because I was sitting there looking, and all of a sudden, my head and arms went straight down. I was almost kissing my knees, could not pick up my head for anything. Pilot knew what was to expect, he didn't tell me. Uh, and I kind of didn't see how we pulled out, because I was looking at my knees the whole time, until uh, the G-forces ended. It was, it was a fun trip. Uh, as we were coming back into the, uh, to the runway to land, uh, we opened up our hatches, because it was a sliding hatch. Uh, and he, what he first said was, uh, hey, why don't you put on your air conditioner? I worked on these airplanes and I knew we didn't have any air conditioning in them. And that's when he opened the hatch. <laughs> and I didn't know you could do that while you were flying, but it was slower then, so you were coming in for landing. What about the demilitarized zone? Did you ever go over? No, no, that was in Vietnam, and that was between North and Viet uh, South Vietnam. But we were, like I said, in a parallel line, we were north of it. So it was always scary. We were, if you went directly east, you were in North Vietnam. And Laos wasn't that wide. Can you explain the NCOIC of plans? Oh, the non-commissioned officer in charge, NCOIC, <laughs> plans and scheduling. Uh, that's when I was here at uh, Griffiths, and uh, as I was making rank and I got up to the master sergeant, senior master sergeant, I was given different positions, uh, flight chief, uh, line chief, NCOIC of plans and scheduling, NCOIC of job connections, or job control. So uh, that, uh, when I became that, uh, the air launch cruise missile was just coming into play for the B-52s. And I was, uh, my job then was uh, developing the flow plans or how to generate the air launch cruise missile onto B-52s. And it was the first time it was being done. So uh, I received some accolades for that because it was a, about a year-long project of month to month going along with the plans and scheduling on how we were going to generate these from one aircraft to two to three to four and so on until we can get the entire fleet generated with air launch cruise missiles in case we ever had to go to war. What Luckily we never had to use that. <laughs> what year did you leave Thailand and come to Rome? Oh, uh, from Thailand I went to other places. Uh, I, See, I was in Thailand from September of 68 to September of 69. Uh, funny story on that too. While I was there, my wife uh, was at Woodstock. So while I was, you know, in, we'll say fighting in Vietnam or in Thailand, Vietnam, she was at Woodstock. So it's kind of diverse personalities there. Uh, but I left 69, went to Altus Air Force Base in Oklahoma. Uh, I asked for Otis. I thought they misspelled it when they gave me Altus. Uh, Altus was not a place I wanted to stay, uh, so much so that I re-enlisted just to get out of there. Uh, and got my base of choice, which was Hanscom Field in Bedford, Massachusetts, which was about 15 miles from my hometown in Lowell. So uh, we went back home and I was able to live in Lowell for a while and then lived in Bedford. Uh, that base closed up, ended up going to Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, just established uh, the flying operation there to cut back, and I ended up going to Travis Air Force Base in California, where I spent another four years. And, uh, then from there, I was trying to get back to Lower New Hampshire and ended up at Griffiths Air Force Base, where I finished my tour. So I spent my last seven years at Griffiths from 1980 to 1987 when I retired. What was your favorite place that you've been with the military? I think they were all fun, except for Altus. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed them all. Uh, Mexico was fun, California was fun, uh, spent a lot of weekends in San Francisco, which is a great place to visit. Uh, being home in you know, Bedford, Massachusetts, or being close to home while in the Air Force was great. Uh, stayed here in Griffiths since 1980, so I've been here for 24 years, so I enjoyed it here. Great place to raise my family. As a kid, did you ever believe that you were going to be in the Air Force? No. My father was in the Army uh, during World War II. He was in the 101st Airborne. He was a paratrooper. 
I always looked at him like, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? You've probably heard that before. Uh, he was a Bronze Star winner, uh, quite a hero. Uh, I think I, you know, my, I had an uncle who was killed uh, in the Battle of Normandy uh, when they were, or was that uh, when they were invading Normandy. Uh, my mother still talks about him, my Uncle Freddy. Uh, all of my uncles were, I think, were in the Army or some branch of the service. So I probably almost had to go in the service uh, just to follow tradition. If you had had any boys, would you expect them to join the military? Uh, when I was younger, probably yes. Uh, now I have to reconsider. I'm not too sure if I'd want them to go. What are the flow plans? It was just a plan of how to put everything together. To generate an airplane, you had to do certain things. You had to fuel it. You had to make sure these things were fixed. You had to load the weapons on board. You had to do certain things in a certain order. And you couldn't do one thing while you were doing something else. Like you couldn't be refueling the airplane and working on the electrical systems. Uh, so there was a time that had to be blocked out for each group. And that all had to be compressed into a timeline of, say, 10 or 12 hours of trying to get everything done. Uh, because, again, we were talking of possibly going to war and having to launch this aircraft fully loaded with nuclear weapons at the time. That was during the Cold War, so things are different now. What was one of the scariest things about dealing with the nuclear weapons? Uh, they were really fairly safe from everything I was told, anyway. I didn't have to work directly on weapons. I wasn't a bomb loader. Uh, but uh, supposedly they had to be armed and they were, you know, you could go out there and beat on them with a hammer. Uh, they weren't going to do anything. But knowing that they were in the area and if anything were, if anybody were to make a mistake, uh, knowing that the entire area was gone, that was probably the scariest thing. What about confidentiality? Did you ever hear a lot of things that you were told to keep hush? Oh yeah, that was all of that was at the time that was secret and top secret. Now it's nothing. But at the time, that was all secret, top secret information. I had a top secret security clearance, and uh, there was a lot of things you just didn't say, you couldn't write down, you couldn't pass on to anybody, unless you had a, a need to know and you had the clearance to justify it. Do you believe our base is still active? What do you mean? Griffiths. Griffiths is active, mm -hmm. uh, not with any weapons or aircraft or munitions or anything. Uh, matter of fact, I think there's more EPA, more uh, cleanup going on than anything else. And if you see all of the heavy uh, equipment running around, they're still digging up soil. Uh, it was contaminated. With what, do you know? No idea. What are ALCMs? Air launch cruise missiles. Uh, in the military, there was a lot of jargon. Everything was initials, and uh, it was military jargon. What do you think about the way the Vietnam War ended? Uh, at the time, I wasn't pleased. Uh, now, uh, I'm not too sure if I really agreed with the Vietnam War. I was probably more of a Kerry fan to protest it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if it was all right and just. At the time, I was very patriotic and thought we needed to be there and we had to fight communism. Uh, but now I look at all of the lives that were lost there and you have to think, was it all worth it? Was it justified? What were some of the highlights of your 20-year military service? Highlights, uh, my retirement was one, <laughs> getting through 20 years. Uh, I don't know if there was any real highlight. Uh, they were, it was a good time, it was a good life, uh, brought up a family. Uh, I enjoyed my time in the service. Uh, as time got along later, I was probably more happy to get out, but uh, the, the initial years, the first 10 to 15 years, I really enjoyed being in the military. It was a great way to to, to live was a great job. How do you feel about the war in Iraq? Uh, totally against it was from the beginning. Uh, I didn't think we had the right to be there. I didn't think we should be the preemptive force to attack a country that was not attacking us. Uh, didn't make us any better than Japan in World War II. Uh, I'm totally against it, have been. Definitely voted for Kerry this time. <laughs> How do you feel about the attacks on September 11th? Uh, that was quite horrific. I remember seeing it and hearing it and we had the TV at work and uh, it was horrific. Uh, 
how to stop it, I don't know. I, I think you know our military intelligence probably blew it in places. Uh, and but that's you know the cost of freedom. Uh, we could shut off our country, be an isolationist country, and not allow anybody in here. Uh, would that have solved it? Maybe. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's some wackos out there, and uh, there's no way I think you can stop all of the wackos from doing what they want to do. How do you feel about how certain people leave their squadrons, or they just give up and walk away? Don't feel comfortable with them doing that. <laughs> you made a commitment, you know, stick through it. Uh, if, you, if you can't stick with it, don't make that commitment. Uh, so, no, to just pick up and walk away is wrong. You have to follow through with what you started. Was there anything like that in town? Mm, no, not that I remember. Uh, nobody went a wall that I can remember. Uh, no, I don't remember. So, if you were asked to go back and help with the war on terror, you would do that. War on terror is one thing. The war in Iraq is something totally different. Uh, I don't, I don't put the two together. Well, what would I you do about the war on terror? Well, I'm too old to do much of anything now. <laughs> well, if you could. Yeah, if I were younger, uh, yeah, would I go back in the military? Possibly. Uh, if I was young enough and strong enough, I might do that. Do you have any strategies for how to do this happen? None whatsoever. Is there anything that you would say to future soldiers? Uh, be careful. Uh, <laughs> you know, speak your mind. Uh, I, there was some recent incidents where some of the soldiers disagreed with some orders of going out in some, uh, I think, some convoys because they felt that they were just suicide missions. And I truthfully can't blame them. Uh, they didn't feel like they were getting the support from their superiors. And uh, when that happens, uh, your military tends to go downhill quickly. The, you know, their superiors have to support you and they have to give you the right equipment and enough uh, safety. If you don't feel that way, you're not going to be the best soldier you're going. Any final words? No, I just uh, thank you for the chance to speak my piece here. Thank you.